Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Nate, as Chris said, and I'm the lead pastor at Restoration Church. And uh, man, what a good week for so many people. Uh, I was just thinking about what's happened from Sunday to Sunday, and uh, a lot of like notable, amazing things have happened. The first, there was pizza with pastors that was after church last week, and uh, and I think we counted there was. 13 or 14 families represented, new families represented that are new to Restoration Church kind of through the summer that were here and were part of it. That's so many of you. Uh, we are glad that you're here and you're a part of Restoration Church. Let's put our hands together. Uh, it's just amazing. I mean, that's what we do. That's why, that's why we're here. That's why we give. That's why we serve. That's why we assemble to worship God, but to help other people to, to learn about God and to worship Him. And so uh, we're just so, um, just so excited that if you're a guest, that you're here today. But for those of you who were a guest at one point, but then have just felt God calling you to follow Him and to be a part of Restoration Church, uh, man, this is awesome. I'm so glad that we're all doing this together. Um, so there was that. Then uh, Jimmy Garoppolo led the Patriots over, uh, over the Cardinals, which was totally unexpected. But man, that was thrilling. Um, the hunting season started this week. I know I've got a couple of chit-chatters about that this morning. Some people got out to go hunting. It's just beautiful weather all week. Um, one of my kids scored a goal in soccer. So that was cool. We had a, a young lady get engaged this week. She sh- was showing off her ring this morning. So exciting. Um, the Red Sox took three straight so far over the Yankees, which is unbelievable. Um, just, man, just so much, so much to praise the Lord about. And then we get to come together and, and, and worship Him. So it's just absolutely thrilling. And um, man, if you're, if you're, you know, it's been a miserable week for you because there, there really has been some difficult things going on. Man, as we get into this series, Imagine Heaven, the one thing that we can kind of look forward to is, man, it is going to be better. And even as great as this week was, like, just think about like th- the greatest moment you had. Heaven is going to be better than that. And we, we just really can't comprehend it. So that's one thing that we're going to be talking about in this series. And the, when we're, we're basing this series and our small group off of this book called Imagine Heaven, it was written by John Burke. He's a pastor in Austin, Texas. And everybody who's joined a circle, you should buy a book. You need to, really do need to buy a book. Um, they're $11 at guest services. You only need one per family. But if you're not going to be in a circle, I definitely still recommend you buy the book. We're not making any profit off of it um, for selling it. We're selling it to you at our cost. And, um, and it's really good. Just, it, just the amazing stories that are in there uh, in the first chapter... Uh, talked about this um, this lady. I can't even. If she was from the um, Philippines, and she, through a translator, was telling her near death experience. And uh, she, the kind of the last sentence of the interview was, "I wish me and my two kids could go there right now." And um, just amazing as we think about this. So, the next six weeks, today and the fo- five following, we're going to be going through this series, going through this book. And then all of our circles will be going through this as well. And just to encourage you to, to sign up for a circle. And some start tonight, um, and they're all at different times throughout the week. So you can find one that'll work for you and for your family. It's going to be amazing. One thing that, I, that happened this week, and I, I didn't think to check the timestamp on this. My, my life is a little bit of a blur. I either took this picture this week or last week. I can't remember. But um, it was after my son's soccer practice, and we were starting to, um, we were walking off the field to go home, and there was this picture, which doesn't, which looks better on my Instagram account. You can follow me there. Um, but, um, but I didn't add anything to it. It was just, just beautiful. As beautiful as someone's worth ever could be. Just beautiful. Pink sky. Pink clouds, bright blue sky, perfectly manicured, you know, baseball field, just gorgeous. Now this picture right here, and even the Instagram picture that's better than this, this one doesn't capture a tenth of the Instagram picture, which doesn't capture a tenth of the beauty 
of that moment in real life. I mean, it was just, you could just stay there forever. And I wanted to, because a couple of the kids, I could hear them having tantrums from a mile away. <laughs> this series, as we talk about heaven, we can't understand how amazing it is. And as we read in this book, and as I, as I share some with you, these accounts of people who, who died, experienced heaven, and then came back to talk about it, we can't even, they can't even begin to describe a percentage point of how amazing it is. But they try, and we're going to try our best to, to imagine that. Pastor John Burke, he read accounts of uh, thousands of near-death experiences in this book. He highlights 120 of them, and he tried to focus on ones that were um, uh, written by doctors, oncologists, medical professionals. He, he referenced their material a lot because they have a lot to lose um, professionally, uh, financially, to, make, uh, to try to make scientific claims about the life after this one. And so he used their story because obviously they're not just some wacko that they found living behind Dover Bowl. Um, these are legitimate professionals who have experienced a lot of different things, and, and they're not all Christian. So there's a lot of people who are beginning now to study this and, and see that, all right, there is a life after this one. But then, just because of their worldview, um, they're, they're not coming to the collusion that we're coming to, that this is an illustration of heaven. These people have seen a picture of heaven. They've seen and experienced Jesus. And, uh, and so he writes about that in the book. And they, uh, one of the statistics that you find in the book is that one in 25 people has had a near-death experience. Now, I never have. I, I, don't, I don't know that I've spoken personally with anybody who has. Um, but there are many books that have been written about it from Christian and non-Christian authors, but there are similarities between all of them. And there are differences too, and some people wonder, all right, well, if they all went to heaven, why didn't they all see the same thing? Now, heaven is probably much bigger than earth as we know it and experience it, but if aliens, which I'm not, I don't believe in aliens, but if aliens were to show up on earth and visit earth, the reports that they give back to their mothership would be very, very different depending on if they uh, landed in India or they landed in the Saharan Desert or they landed in the Antarctic or they landed at the Grand Canyon or they landed at Walmart. It'd be very, very different stories <laughs> depending on where they, where they landed. And so as different people begin to speak about their experience, they have, they have a kind of experience a different part of the heavenly landscape. So I want, to, um, I want to kind of talk about some things. Now, if you, are, uh, if you are a Christian in the 1980s, as I, as I was, for the, for the church to be talking about near-death experiences is really kind of bizarre and you might be uncomfortable with it and be like, oh no, I wonder if our, if our church has gone kooky or um, if we're, you know, if we've become kind of new age or mystical. Uh, because growing up, just the impression that, that I was taught as a kid is we don't talk about these things because these things aren't biblical and they're not true. They're, you know, they're, they're meant to d disturb us or, ca or counterfeit us. But what we believe is that the people, whether Christian or non-Christian, they've been given um, a picture, they've been given an experience of heaven. And whether or not they know it was heaven or believe it was Jesus, and whether or not they decide to follow Jesus after that experience, we believe all of the things they talk about, or the maj maj majority of the things that they talk about as they try to interpret and, and replay and describe to us a picture of what they saw, um, you can find th many of the key themes within Scripture. And so we'll be looking at that this week. Now, let's imagine for a second, it's the point of your life where you 
that you fear the most the moment you breathe your last breath. And that's a, that, that's a, uh, you, you know, for most people, it's a scary thing. I have had the privilege of pastoring some people who were not afraid of that moment. As it came down to the last days of their life, they looked at me confidently and said, I'm so excited to meet Jesus. Well, you, you know, those are people who have lived a long, fulfilling life. But um, for most of us, if we were to think if something were happen, if this year was our last year, if these months were, or these moments were our last moments, we're, there's still a fear and uncertainty. Is there really a life after this one? Is there really a heaven? You know, how can I really be sure? And the accounts that were discovered um, all seem to point to Jesus. So imagine you breathe your last breath. Now, John Burke, as he, as he read and, and interviewed people who experienced near-death experience, they all report kind of the same thing happening, that when their earthly body died, they couldn't tell that they were even dead because they felt more alive and more themselves than they ever had before. Of all the near-death experiences um, that were recorded, when their earthly body turned off, they were still in the vicinity and were still able to, to see the things that were going on. John Burke read and interviewed skeptical cardiologists, oncologists, and other doctors who revived those people. And their near-death accounts began to convince many skeptical doctors that there is an afterlife. I want to read to you a part in the book of, on uh, page 40. So we're talking about Dr. Jeffrey Long. He's a radiation oncologist. And he had read about near-death experiences in the Journal of uh, American Medical Association. And, and so he began to be skeptical, and he had never experienced anyone, or he'd never, um, he'd never talked with anybody who'd experienced that as a doctor. So he began to ask questions of, um, of people that, um, that, that this had happened to. So while he was at dinner with friends one night, the, the lady, one of the ladies he's, he was with, talked about how she had an allergic reaction a few years back, and, um, and her heart stopped breathing, or her heart, heart stopped beating. And so he asked her, did you experience anything when that happened? And so at that dinner, she reported this. I found myself at ceiling level. I could see the EKG machine I was hooked to. The EKG was flatlined. The doctors and nurses were frantically trying to bring me back to life, the scene below me was a near panic situation. In contrast to the chaos below, I felt a profound sense of peace. I was completely free of any pain. My consciousness drifted out of the operating room and moved into a nursing station. I immediately recognized that this was the nursing station on the floor where I had been prior to my surgery. From my vantage point near the ceiling, I saw the nurses bustling about performing their daily duties. After watching the nurses a while, the, a tunnel opened up. I was drawn to the tunnel. Then I passed through the tunnel and became aware of a bright line at the end of the tunnel. I felt peaceful. After I passed through the tunnel, I found myself in an area of beautiful, mystical light. In front of me were several of my beloved relatives who had previ previously died. It was a joyous reunion, and we embraced. I found myself with a mystical being of overwhelming love and compassion. Do you want to go ba back, he asked. I responded, I don't know, which was just like my old indecisive self at the time. After further discussion, I knew the choice to return to my physical body was mine. It was a most difficult decision. I was in a realm of overwhelming love. In this realm, I knew I was truly home. Finally, I returned to my body. I awoke in the ICU over a day later. I had tubes and wires all over me. I could not talk about my profound experience. Later, I returned to the floor of the hospital, returned to the floor of the hospital where I had been before surgery. Here was the nursing station I visited during my near-death experience. I finally worked up the courage to share what I saw during my near-death experience with one of the nurses. The nurse responded with a look of shock and fright. This was a Catholic hospital. Not surprisingly, a nun was sent over, a nun was sent over to talk with me. 
I patiently explained all that I experienced. The nun listened carefully, then declared my experience to be the work of the devil. You can understand my enormous reluctance to share my near-death experience with anyone after this. Jo- Dr. Long, after, um, after hearing this story, said this, I remember thinking these experiences could change my views about life, God, death, and the world we live in. The Lancet, uh, right, it, let me read you, um, oh, so The Lancet is a medical journey, journal, United Kingdom Medical Journal. Uh, it's prestigious, well-known. Um, there is an account written in that about a, um, a patient who had a cardiac arrest and he wasn't breathing. At the time, a tube was being placed in the airway to ventilate the patient. It was noted that he had upper dentures. The dentures were removed and placed in a crash cart drawer while the patient was deeply comatose. Over a week later, the patient reported having an out-of-body experience and accurately described the room he was resuscitated in and the people present. Remarkably, he declared that his lost dentures could be found in the crash cart drawer. Just un- these unexplainable moments that people are reporting, that medical professionals are writing and documenting, that, are, are, that is kind of turning these doctors' lives upside down and is realizing that there's too much detail and too many things have happened that these people could not know and and is showing that something is happening after they die. Page uh, 48 in the book, uh, a Dutch doctor relayed uh, an adult's childhood near-death experience. When I was five years old, I contracted meningitis and fell into a coma. I died. I felt no fear, no pain. I felt at home in this place. I saw a little girl of about 10 years old. I sensed that she recognized me. We hugged, and then she told me, I'm your sister. I was named after your grandmother. Our parents called me, and I don't know how to, it's a Dutch name. Uh, We'll say um, Robbie for short. (laughs) She kissed me, and I felt her warmth and love. You must go now, she said. In a flash, I was back in my body. I opened my eyes and saw the happy and relieved look on my parents' faces. I told them about my experience and made a drawing of my sister who had welcomed me and repeated everything she told me. My parents were so shocked that they panicked. They got up and left the room. After a while, they returned. They confirmed that they had indeed lost a daughter named Robbie. She had died of poisoning. They had decided not to tell me and my brother until we were old enough to understand the meaning of life and death. There are nearly 900, there are 900 articles on near-death experience that have been written in scholarly literature since 2011. These aren't just blogs. Every story should be filtered with a measure of skepticism. We're not saying that all of the things that have happened uh, really happened or every, there was a, a kind of a famous event recently where one guy was found out he made, a teenager found out he made up his entire story of his near-death experience, and uh, he had, after his book was published. And, um, and so, but we look at all of these thousands of experiences, we find the commonality between those, we compare those with scripture, and we begin to see that, that they have experienced something that we hope for and that we anticipate. Now, let's talk about heaven for just a second and kind of get on the same page as understanding this. One, to understand that God doesn't need heaven. In Genesis 1.1, it says that God created the heavens and the earth. He created heaven for you and I who would decide to follow Jesus while we're here on this earth. God doesn't need it. Heaven's not God's home. Heaven's our future home. And, um, and so... It's something that he's created. And how you think about heaven will affect everything you do. It'll affect how you love, how you sacrifice, how you forgive. And it brings an understanding of why Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. 
Heaven has been described so poorly within the church circles or on TV that we dread having to go there. We don't ever want to leave this earth. We are afraid even that heaven will be this eternal church service. But I want to, um, I want to, we're going to watch a, a video here. It's about 15 minutes long that we're going to do right here in this service. So the first is kind of a news article that was on Christian Broadcasting Network uh, documenting uh, a doctor who died in a kayaking accident. And so there's that part of it. Then there's a live interview, or it's not live to us, but it was live at the time, that John Burke, the author of the book, interviewed this doctor. And so we're going to watch this together, and then I'll be back up here on the stage after that. Dr. Mary Neal is an orthopedic surgeon who shares her medical practice and her love for outdoor adventure with her husband, Bill. In 1999, they planned an adventure that took Mary on a spiritual journey few have taken and returned to talk about. My husband and I really enjoy kayaking. We enjoy traveling. We speak Spanish. We've traveled internationally a number of times. And so for my husband's birthday, I said, okay, this is the year we're going to do it. So we went to Chile for a vacation to kayak. After a week of kayaking, Bill sat out the final day with a sore back. Mary and the rest of their group kayaked through a treacherous stretch of the river. These are drops of 10 to 15 feet, 20 feet maybe, which for an experienced kayaker is not a crazy thing. I went over the main drop and as I crested over the drop, I could see the tremendous turbulence and tremendous volume. And as I hit the bottom of the drop, the front end of my boat became pinned. I and my boat were immediately and completely submerged. I was absolutely pressed to the front deck of the boat. And I couldn't move my arms even back far enough to reach my spray skirt, let alone push myself out. I very sincerely asked that God's will be done. And I meant it. After several minutes of searching, the group leaders realized Mary was trapped under the falls. They came out on the rocks and they kept trying to get to the boat, but the force and the volume of the water was such that they just kept being flushed through. I mean, they just couldn't get to me. At one point, they sort of recognized that it was really turning into body recovery. Uh, not so much of a rescue. I know I've been underwater too long to be alive, yet I feel more alive than I've ever felt. And this is more real than anything I've ever experienced. So help me welcome Dr. Mary Neal. Thank you. And, and you said you, you, from the point your kayak got stuck, it was 30 minutes yes. before, so you were gone that much time. And I know you said it was realer than real, but when you came back, you still were trying to figure out what was that, what kind of, talk about some of the, the, the questions you asked and went through. I came back knowing that my experience had been real, but desperately trying to convince myself otherwise. I had great motivation to discount my experience as being a dream or hallucination or something along those lines because if I were to accept that my experience was real and true, then I also had to accept that everything I'd been told was real and true, including things I didn't want to accept, including the coming death of my oldest son, including some health issues with my husband and this mandate to share my experience with other people, which is definitely not something I would have signed up for. Uh, but I, I spent many, many months trying to discount my experience, trying to chalk it up to being a dream, which is something, first of all, I'm not that creative. Second of all, dreams are very different. They're usually uh, very chaotic, very poorly remembered. They involve people who are still alive, whereas near-death experiences are very logical. They're very sequential. Uh, They involve people who are already dead. They never involve people who are still alive. And the memory is very, very different. 
people who've had near-death experiences remember the experience as precisely and accurately 50 years later as when it was actually happening. So I was able to very quickly discount that. I considered whether it could be a hallucination from neurotransmitter release, but the chemicals that are released in a dying brain are very toxic to the brain, and the cells that are most sensitive to death are actually the ones that create memories. And so I spent many months and in the end came to the realization that no, my experience was outside the realm of science, outside the realm of medicine and... But not uncommon. Very common. It's surprising that within a room this size, there are many, many people who have either had a near-death experience or had a friend or relative, yeah. but they don't talk about it. Yeah. Well, it's very personal, right? Hard, hard to talk about. It's very difficult. Yeah. So take us back to that day. I mean, here you are pinned under a waterfall. You realize you can't get loose. I mean, that must yeah. have been terrifying. One would think so, but I felt great. <laughs> I had always feared a drowning death, but actually I felt no fear. I felt no panic. I felt no sense of air hunger. I felt wonderful. And the moment that I very consciously made a choice to surrender the outcome, I truly asked that God's will be done, regardless of whether that meant I was to live or die. The very moment that I asked that, I was overcome with a very physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured by Christ that everything was fine. My husband would be fine, my young children would be fine regardless. And I was this receptacle into which Christ was pouring his love and his very being. And that was the first of many profound aspects of this experience because I was no saint. <laughs> I tried to be a good person, but. I did not deserve to be held or loved by Christ, just like, you know, none of us ever no, deserve yeah. anything. And while I was being held, my life, as you said earlier, was just laid bare for all of the, the high points and low points. And so it was like a life review? We started a life review, and it was Is it not like you re-experience your life, or what? I know, we're going to go into... We're, we're, it's, it's difficult. It's all simultaneously occurring, and it everything is present at the same time and not with any sense of judgment which is what I would have assumed would have happened but we then at one point went through my life and looked at all of the events that I would have otherwise said were terrible or bad or horrible or sad or tragic and I had the most remarkable experience of seeing that event not three or four five times removed but seeing how a given event impacted me, impacted my little world and the world as a whole. When seen from a vantage point of 25, 30, 35 times removed, and what I was shown again and again and again and again is that God's promise is true, that indeed beauty comes from all things, even when we can't see it. Mm. He works all things together for the good. Absolutely. So, so you experienced this life review you were you were underwater like 15 minutes or something and then yes. when you came up and they found you they started their stopwatch and it was another 15 right so what what where were you and what were you doing i was gone <laughs> <laughs> i was still aware of the physicality of it all i could feel the water i could feel the plastic of the boat my body was sucked over the deck of the boat by the current and as my body was coming out of the boat my spirit peeled away from my body and eventually I then rose up and out of the river and I was greeted by a group of somethings people spirits beings all those words seem sort of hokey to me but but they had these bodies were, they were what, what they was like? did have physical form they had head arms legs they were wearing these um, robes that were very indistinct somewhat translucent or pearlescent and were radiant, absolutely more brilliant than the sun, but not in a blinding sense. And they were absolutely exploding with beauty and an absolutely pure, unconditional love of God. And it's a love that we don't experience. We experience conditional love. Mm -hmm. But this was an absolute love. And they were so overjoyed to greet me and welcome me and love me and guide me and there was a shift of 
time and dimension so that I could be with them. And I was trying very desperately to get down this exceptionally beautiful path to this great dome structure of sorts that I knew without any doubt was the point of no return. So was, that was like the entrance It to was, I feel like I was in heaven, but I was definitely in the, the foyer. Mm -hmm. And this was <laughs> the point at which there was no return. And I could simultaneously look back at the river and see the guys pull my body to shore and see them start CPR. And I was really surprised at that point because I recognized my body as mine, as representing my life, my husband, my children. And I had a great life. I have a great life. I had every reason in the world to return. But I looked at my body and I knew I was not coming back. I knew that I had absolutely no intention to return because I was absolutely overcome with this sensation or this experience of being home, of being where I really belong, where we all really belong. It was as though I'd been on this long and wonderful journey to Earth, but now I was home. I was going to sleep in my own bed. I, it was wonderful. And so I, I kept going down this path as quickly as I could. And, and there was beauty the beauty uh, spoke to me. I absolutely believe that God presents to each one of us, just like on earth, God meets us where we are. And I believe that God presents to each one of us that experience, that scene that will speak to us and that we can understand, that will make us feel comfortable and loved and welcomed. And for me, it was color and flowers and the aroma of flowers because that's what really moves my soul. And they, were they like real? I mean, when you, it was, you know, people kind of still, we think it's kind of probably fuzzy. No, it was and, real, it was, but it was different. Because here on earth, we feel this table and it's real. But we can't understand the table. We can't hear the table. We can't, we can't feel experience. the love of the table. We can't experience the table. But there, the, the flowers, the aromas, the, the colors were multi- uh, faceted, I could understand them. It's like you I, experience it in I a whole new way. I experienced in a life. very different way. Yeah. And we then reached this threshold and I was there for what felt like many, many hours. And while I was there, uh, I had many uh, profound parts of this experience, but one of which was this sense of understanding, of, of getting it. Understanding the divine order of everything. And one of the things that was so important to me is coming to an understanding of how it can really be true that there is a God who is real and present and that there is a God who actually knows each and every one of us, all billions of us on the planet, loves each and every one of us as though we're the only ones and has a plan for each and every one of our lives that's one of hope. And for me, that was life-changing. And it should be life changing. Yeah. And, and then I got kicked out. And then <laughs> <laughs> it was traumatic. What, what did they say? Uh, I was told that I, it wasn't my time. I still had more work to do on earth and that I had to go back to my... I did what I think any reasonable person would do, and I said, I'm good. I was told I, everything was fine. I, I can stay. And... Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a doctor, not a lawyer, so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> and as part of that um, discussion of whether I could stay or not, I was then told about some of the work I still had to do, including this mandate to share my experiences with other people and the coming death of my son and some other things. And then I was taken back down this path and reunited with my body. And, you know, I... I I think it's important because um, so many people uh, would say, well, why, why wouldn't God give us all that experience, right? I mean, that would make it so much easier, right? Well, it would. And I've had many, many people say, gee, I really would love to have your experience. But what they're really saying is, I'd like the spiritual experience, but I don't really want to drown or break my legs or do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> the coming back. Uh, yeah. And I asked that question for a long time. Yeah, because, I mean, and in your book, you write uh, about 
see, seeing Jesus and asking right. him, why doesn't everybody right. have this experience? And the fact is, there is great power in using the free will and free choice with which we're created. And even Thomas, if you go back to the Bible, I mean, Thomas was like me. He wanted to stick his finger in the hole. And Christ said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And I said for many years... And he years, said the same thing to you? He did. And I for many years I said that, you know, I, I lost my faith and I was very sad about that. What do you but mean? it was replaced with a trust. Oh. Because it re was replaced with knowledge. But the fact is, even though Christ said that and even though it is true, I would say that actually everybody can see because I absolutely believe that although not everyone's going to have the dramatic experience I had, every single person can experience God's presence in their life and experience God's miracles mm -hmm. if they look for them, if they acknowledge them for what they are. Yeah. Well, we're going to hear more from, from Dr. Neal. So we're going to videotape her, and throughout the weeks, we're going to have little segments as well, and we'll post the whole thing somewhere. But let's thank Dr. Neal for taking thank the time you. to be here. Thank you so much. We, uh, we also will have those clips of, from Dr. Neal, from Don Piper, who wrote a book, 90 Minutes to Heaven, at different points throughout our messages um, the next few weeks. Uh, Pastor John's going to come forward, and Mike and Lorena are going to come forward. And, you know, this is just the beginning of this message, this Imagining Heaven. And, and probably already at this point, um, you, you know, it, there's, a, there's an excitement like, man, um, uh, it's going to be so good. And uh, as great as, you know, it's so great to experience and, and know Jesus and follow him right now. And, um, and man, it's not even, it's just... Just a small bit of how great and amazing it's going to be. Uh, next week, we're talking about relationships within heaven. So just think about the people you love and, and miss. And uh, we're going to talk about that next week. It's going to be awesome. But we don't want to move forward without giving you an opportunity to make a decision to follow Jesus. And so we're going to pray together. It's just out loud all together. And when you... When you pray this, and, and, you know, it's just that hope, like, man, God, I want to I wanna know Jesus. I want to experience what, what they talk about. I want to experience what Pastor Nate talked about this morning. I, I want to I wanna be in heaven one day. I want to follow you today. Just when, when you pray this prayer with that faith and, and with that desire, the Bible says you're saved. These words aren't magic, but it's the belief in your heart that you express with your mouth that does something transformational in your life. All of your sin is forgiven. Your eternity is set in place. And there is a, there's a life for you today and a Jesus to know and follow and to, be, to, to, to love and become friends with. We're going to pray together, and everybody wants you to close your eyes and and you pray this prayer, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, who died on the cross so I could be saved. I believe he took my sins, and with my heart I believe you raised him from the dead. So now with my mouth I confess, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I know that you've heard me pray. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. In, um, uh, in a moment, we'll uh, give you opportunity to come forward. And those of you who prayed that prayer to, uh, to follow Jesus, we want you to come forward and to talk with Pastor John. Pastor John wants to give you a book and, and help you now to begin that walk with Jesus because your time to start the life after this one could be 45 years from now. And there is a work that God has for you. There is a plan that he has for you. There's a purpose that he has for you. 
It's like Dr. Mary Neal returned because there was a, a job for her to do. You haven't gone yet because there's a job for you to do. So we'll invite you forward for that. And then you're invited to come forward and for prayer for anything with Mike and Laureen. They're going to, we sang it already this morning. Uh, uh, I don't even remember the exact words, but a miracle is going to happen because the presence of the Lord is here. This time, we're going to receive our tithes and our offerings, and uh, just so grateful for all of your giving. Thank you. Um, just thank you for that. We sometimes, we don't understand how our, our gift has made any difference. We don't, you know, it, you know, it, maybe we think it just paid a bill, or we underestimate the impact it's made, but uh, Dr. Neal, she, she talked about how in her life review, she'd be able to see things 25 times removed, removed like, all right, this happened, but then b- because of a series of events, now this positive thing happened for the kingdom of God, t- kind of 25 um, points later. And our giving, as we, we give our 10% and we give our missions giving, um, and we put that in the offering, we think, oh, it's just, I just... I just gave it, nothing happened. But we're seeing things happen every single week. Those are the, just the things we're seeing. Uh, it was three weeks ago, and a, a 20-year-old single mom came up to Pastor John after the service, said, I want to follow Jesus. And John prayed with her and gave her a follow book. And I, that was the Sunday morning we had the baptism. So I got to meet her at the baptism following service. And she was there with her sister. And her, her older sister told me I was praying for my sister the whole time. And, uh, and, you know, she would like it. And, and the, the sister who came to Christ that morning, she hadn't been in any, she hadn't been into a church building in over 12 years. But because of what God's doing through us, she's following Jesus. Had the privilege of going over uh, one of the new families in our church, going over to their house. Friday night and, and um, just just hanging out, but the but the the um, the young lady of the um, she came to U-turn like eight years ago, and we knew her. And we're in her life and investing, and now here all these years later, she has her and her fiance and their kids coming coming to church every week and joining a circle and starting now to serve God as a family. Unbelievable. And so I, man, I just, I can't thank you enough for your generosity and your obedience because we are seeing things happen. And people this morning prayed that prayer and made a decision to follow Jesus. And the people that you invite to come next week, they're going to pray that prayer and starting a relationship following Jesus. And we are going to hang out with them. If we go before they, just imagine that moment when you're at the greeting line in heaven and just saying, um, it's so good to see you again. I'm so glad. I remember that Sunday when you made the decision to follow Jesus. And here we are in heaven together. Come here. Let me show you the sports car collection and the golf courses and the throne room of God. Let me pray. Jesus, we don't give reluctantly, we give cheerfully. God, we don't give religiously, we give joyfully. We don't give to keep a building going, we give to reach just one more with the good news of Jesus. And I pray Every person in here hasn't yet made the decision to follow him. They'll make that decision today or, or in this sermon series. And God, for everyone in here who's thinking, I mean, I have a friend I need to invite next week. I just pray that they will get the courage to do that, that you would prepare the hearts of their friends that they'd come in, they'd hear about you, they'd hear about heaven, and they'd commit their lives to following you. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. As ushers go forward, um, you're welcome. We're going to sing just for a few more seconds, then Jeremy will dismiss you. 
but you can come forward now to be prayed for, or you can wait uh, to the very end. I, uh, I love you guys, and I'll see you at the uh, leadership lunch here in just a couple minutes.